If we can't answer all of the questions during the session, and that is likely there are a large number of you, we will provide answers in writing to the email address that you use to sign up for the event, and they'll also be made available on our website. If you are hard of hearing or if you are experiencing any sound issues, you can turn on live captions by clicking on the three small dots at the top of your screen above more and click turn on live captions near the bottom of the drop down list. Hopefully the banner came up to let you know that this session is being recorded. This recording will be shared on our YouTube channel in the next few days and available on our website. Again, we will send you a link um, via email to access this recording, along with a copy of the PowerPoint slides you'll be seeing today and the Q&A on our website. Next slide. So today for the first hour, you'll be hearing from our technical staff, Ike and Mark, who will be followed by Crown appointed investigator, Mr. John Hardy. We also have staff working behind the scenes to keep the session moving and making sure your questions as you type them into the Q&A are being logged as we go through the presentation. I will now hand over to Mark to introduce himself. Uh, thank you, Tessa. Uh, my name is Mark Stevenson. I'm manager of planning at Christchurch City Council and I'm joined today by Ike Kleinboss, uh, principal advisor in the team. Next slide. So um, the purpose of today's presentation is to provide some context of Council's obligations under the Resource Management Enabling Housing and Other Matters Amendment Act and the National Policy Statement on Urban Development. It will uh, we'll provide an overview of what work we've been undertaking since September at which time the council made its decision to not approve the notification of Plan Change 14. We'll give a summary of what that alternative, what an alternative proposal looks like and which we've been developing um, and answer questions in the time we have remaining. Next slide. So in terms of the matters we'll cover today. There's um, the scope of uh, what we're required to do, as I've outlined. The work progressed since the decision in September, the alternative and uh, the role of the investigator, which um, at which time we'll hand to John Hardy. Next slide. So in terms of the work completed this year, in May, in April and May this year, we released draft versions of Plan Change 13 on Heritage, Plan Change 14 on Housing and Business Choice, and Plan Change 15 on Radio, radio Communication Pathways. That was an opportunity for people to provide feedback on those draft changes, and we received over 700 responses to that, which we've subsequently reviewed and considered the feedback on. We released a summary of and following that we incorporate uh, we sought to address feedback in a version that was presented to council in September for approval to notify. Since that decision, as I've mentioned, we have been developing an alternative proposal that has considered the feedback received from April and May, as well as subsequent work we've been uh, doing and that's included the testing of alternatives. So uh, this may not require any introduction to some of you, um, but the National Policy Statement on Urban Development was introduced in 2020. That directed changes to our district plan to enable intensification, particularly policies three and four, of that national policy statement and that required higher greater heights and density in and around our commercial centers including the central city thereafter um, in 2000 in 2021 parliament amended the resource management act and that introduced medium density residential standards 
which requires us to implement and through plan change 14 propose those standards across relevant residential zones we can of course um, apply qualifying matters as a method to preclude that level of intensification in areas where appropriate and we'll talk about that further in may of this year the minister required a number of councils to have their have decisions made on their intensification planning instruments by august 2023 that was uh, following hearings by an, an independent hearings panel now the um given the decision of council we don't anticipate decisions being made by august 2023 but a date for decisions to be made is yet to be confirmed and would require a direction from the minister next slide Hello everyone. Uh, as Mark said, my name is uh, Ike Columbus. I'm a uh, principal advisor here in the city planning team. Um, and so in terms of what the legislation actually requires that, that Mark mentioned, um, like mentioned, uh, uh, MDRS, uh, which is the medium density residential standards, uh, requires that up to three uh, houses per section be enabled um, up to 12 metres high or uh, about three storeys in height as well. Now, MDRS, the medium density residential standards, um, must apply to all relevant residential zones um, within an urban environment. Uh, and that's set in the Act and prescribed uh, in terms of what that's defined as. Um, we have to allow um, for more houses to be built uh, within and around uh, those commercial centres as directed um, by the NPSUD, the National Policy Statement for Urban Development uh, that Mark mentioned. And there are situations uh, where uh, developments uh, will require a written approval. Uh, however, that has been definitely made more lenient uh, through the MDRS uh, standards and also very much made more lenient through subdivision standards as well, which we must incorporate um, as part of the intensification plan change. We can identify what's known as qualifying matters, uh, in other words, restrictions, where it's inappropriate for uh, intensification to progress. Next slide. Um, under policy three, it really is the strongest direction for intensification uh, greater than uh, MDRS. And so for the central city, for example, this directs that there's a, a, a requirement to have a maximised development capacity within the centre. And so for most councils who have gone through this process, um, they have uh, interpreted this as being uh, uh, no height limit that's set. Now, that doesn't mean to say that there is no uh, resource consent requirement, uh, but in terms of it being an enabling consenting regime, um, there's no uh, height limit prescribed as such. As part of the proposal to date, um, we have proposed a height limit of 90 metres uh, in terms of when uh, a greater uh, level of resource consent will be required, noting there that uh, under the proposed provisions to date, uh, we have a threshold of 22 metres set before resource consent is required um, with the upper limit of 90 metres for a, a greater level of uh, evidence through our resource consent process. Policy three also directs that um, at least uh, six storeys uh, must be uh, enabled uh, within at least a walkable catchment from the edge of the city centre. Um, and that must be increased based on the, uh, uh, the propensity of uh, uh, walking and also uh, the amount of services uh, facilities that are provided for in each of those centres. There's a commensurate response that is required for all of the other uh, suburban uh, commercial centres that lie outside of the city centre as well. Next slide, please. So in terms of the scope for the residential uh, aspects of um, the plan change, uh, this is really uh, as follows uh, in terms of the existing residential zones that we have within the district plan. Uh, and so uh, the suburban uh, new neighbourhood uh, residential hill zone, suburban transition, medium density and central city residential zones are all considered to be within scope of where MGRS needs to apply at a minimum. Uh, and then elements of the Banks Peninsula Zone only within 
uh, the Littleton extent are also included. And so those um, other zones uh, on the edge of the urban environment, uh, small settlement zones and alike, are considered to be outside of scope. And so what this means is that the uh, intensification plan change isn't able to, for example, extend the urban environment uh, outwards onto, for example, uh, greenfield or rural areas uh, that are not currently zoned for uh, urban residential means. Next slide, please. So from a spatial extent, it uh, looks a little something like this in terms of what has to be considered to be uh, within scope in terms of those urban uh, residential parcels. Um, and so we are able also to consider uh, the commercial centres, like I mentioned, that are also within this extent uh, in terms of giving direction uh, to the NTSUD for intensification within those commercial centres and their surrounds. There's also other associated or related provisions that we're able to consider, such as subdivision, fencing, engineering, uh, access and the like, that help to support and facilitate the delivery of that intensification direction. And like I said before, um, anything outside of this urban environment isn't considered to be within scope of this plan change. So, for example, uh, rural sites and the like uh, are not considered or are unable to be considered as part of the intensification plan change. Next slide, please. In terms of what we can influence, um, like I mentioned, qualifying matters can be used uh, to uh, show where there is a should be a restriction on intensification, where it's inappropriate really to have any further um, intensification, uh, which would otherwise be directed um, by the Act. There's a high threshold for what can be considered to be a qualifying matter. Um, much of this is prescribed in the Act uh, and also prescribes what uh, evidential threshold needs to be met um, if those uh, I guess pre-prescribed uh, standards are not achieved that are outlined in the Act. We can also influence um, how we consider uh, walkable catchments from the uh, central city and other suburban centres. So there's an example there shown on the image for the different walking catchments that have been applied. Uh, height limits as well, um, you know, we have to have a commensurate response. So we've done uh, work to uh, conceptualise um, and assess what all of the commercial centres uh, provide and uh, provide a hierarchical response to um, intensification around that, uh, linking to that commensurate response for those commercial centres as well. Next slide, please. So in terms of um, MDRS or the medium density residential standards, uh, I guess a very quick refresher, um, this sets some uh, fundamental uh, controls that really can't be adjusted um, through the plan change process unless there is a qualifying matter that is identified. And it sets the following standards. So it changes the recession plane controls for all of those um, uh, urban residential zones to be taken at four metres and 60 degrees. Uh, there has to be a uh, 1.5 metre setback from the street or, or no less than, and, and one metre for any of the other side or rear boundaries. 50% site coverage, a minimum of 20, uh, 20 square metres of outdoor living space at the ground floor and less or above this. A minimum of 20% glazing on the street facade and 20% landscaping um, as well. Uh, council does have the ability um, to nuance these to make them only more lenient uh, and only more restrictive uh, if there is a qualifying matter. Next slide, please. So in terms of the high density proposal, um, this is very much directed, like I said before, uh, through policy three, um, and that sets the minimum heights and the commensurate response that we uh, need to respond to. Um, and it really has to respond to a hierarchy of centres. And so the larger the centre, the more intensification that needs to be enabled. So in the table below shows an overview for the different centre types that we have uh, categorised as part of this plan change process, uh, their location, the extent that we have applied the uh, intensification um, uh, in terms of the walking catchments and also the enabled height. So, um, for example, uh, the, the smaller, uh, you know, neighbourhood centres and uh, smaller uh, local centres, uh, we haven't sought to intensify any further um, because they really aren't at a scale where that is considered to be appropriate. The medium uh, local centres or larger all have an intensification response uh, and those uh, that are uh, uh, large local centres 
uh, or greater, um, all have an enabled consenting uh, pathway for or for six stories. And so within all of these areas, there's a high density um, zone uh, that applies uh, and that sets a minimum, um, uh, or oh, sorry, I should say a maximum a height that is permitted of 14 metres. So we have made the interior standards more lenient uh, to better achieve the outcomes of the high density zone. And then so above 14 metres consent um, is required uh, and that goes um, up to six storeys in those instances. Um, what I will say is that uh, around the central city, uh, it's slightly different. So uh, the first uh, city block effectively around the central city zone is enabled to uh, up to 10 storeys or 32 metres in height, uh, and then thereafter goes to uh, 20 metres or six storeys in height. Next slide, please. Um, so in terms of uh, the currently proposed qualifying matters as we have within the proposal to date. Um, this is captured on the slide and you know categorised uh, in terms of those headings. So we do have quite a few qualifying matters that are currently captured within the proposal. Um, a lot of those are uh, carrying over the existing controls that we have um, within the district plan at the moment. Uh, and so, for example, uh, airport noise contours, um, uh, railway setbacks and the like, uh, those are existing uh, restrictions that we have captured as qualifying matters, uh, proposed to capture as qualifying matters as part of the proposal. But for example, uh, radio communication pathways, uh, and vacuum sewer constraint areas uh, and other character areas that we've identified and heritage areas are all considered to be new qualifying matters that we have uh, proposed to introduce as uh, part of this intensification plan change. Next slide, please. So as part of the alternative, um, we are considering uh, a number of new um, or updated uh, qualifying matters um, which are captured in this table here. So first and foremost in the table there you have uh, key transport corridors and this is really trying to uh, reflect the fact that the Rickerton and Papua Nui corridors are really the preeminent uh, public transport corridors and we need to protect those in terms of any development that exists uh, close to the road boundary to uh, enable any further growth of that corridor uh, in the long term to help deliver those public transport outcomes. And um, public uh, open space, um, this was one that we hadn't really captured at all uh, as part of the uh, original proposal in September, uh, most notably because we took really uh, the prescribed qualifying matters uh, which includes open space as read. Um, however, looking closely at the policy three direction, uh, this is really a, a, a ubiquitous kind of uh, approach to intensification, as in it really influences any area that is within those walkable catchments. Uh, and so that's why we've had to go through this additional process to identify um, public open space. So there's no uh, I guess real new difference there in terms of what's currently protected in the district plan, uh, as simple as ensuring that those open space areas are protected. We are also looking into the residential uh, industrial interface um, and what effects we can manage along there, uh, most notably around acoustic controls. Uh, and so it remains to be seen exactly how that looks, but something that we're working on um, at the moment. So Greenfield development features um, is also one that we are responding to due to policy three, uh, and that is because there are uh, two areas where there is a, a larger commercial centre, um, which is within a walkable catchment where we have to apply high density, and they are the North Hallswell um, Commercial Centre, which is uh, a Greenfield site yet to be developed, uh, and also what's known as the East Papua Nui um, Outline Development Plan area close to the Papua Nui um, a commercial centre. Uh, and so because both of those areas are within the walkable catchment, even though they are greenfield development, whereas previously we had proposed to have those as future urban zone, um, we are uh, proposing to include that as a high density zone. And all of the outline plan development features that we have to manage greenfield development within and around those areas um, are proposed at this stage to be carried over uh, as a qualifying matter or as a QM, as we've um, annotated there. We're also looking at to property access to uh, areas with uh, high natural hazard uh, risk. Uh, and so at the moment, we've only captured those areas exactly where the risk feature exists. 
Um, but we recognise that in a, a natural hazard scenario, uh, property access may very well be impeded or completely inaccessible um, for areas that aren't uh, uh, exactly covering, for example, a flooding area, but the flooding area, for example, covers a whole street. And so we're doing some uh, work to capture uh, those areas that, that would be inaccessible from from natural hazard risk, and that includes also the coastal uh, inundation areas um, that we uh, proposed as part of the uh, proposal uh, for September um, uh, as well. The Reckon and Bush interface as well has been reviewed, so uh, Council did propose initially uh, just those uh, interfacing sites um, of about 40 sites. Um, we have um, done a lot more work to uh, provide a bit more analysis um, on the justification for um, any further uh, uh, restriction uh, in areas around record and bush. And so we've sought to commission uh, heritage, heritage landscape uh, architects evidence uh, in terms of um, any protections for uh, development around that area. And as a result of that, that suggests that um, it's appropriate to uh, restrict up to about 250 sites around that area. And so effectively the area that is between Rickerton Bush uh, and the Rickerton uh, Commercial Centre uh, is uh, uh, quite well restricted really, um, or proposed to be as part of the alternative um, because of this additional evidence that um, we have sought. Uh, and this also reflects the outcomes um, of mana whenua uh, and also the uh, ecological uh, benefits would be attained from uh, greater restriction for there as well. Uh, heritage items and areas, um, there are a number of areas that were further reviewed based on um, some of the councillor resolutions uh, that we have uh, reassessed uh, or, or assessed uh, wholly new. Um, and most of those areas from the resolutions, uh, if not all, um, uh, haven't met the criteria in terms of new uh, heritage areas, there are some heritage items that have um, that are proposed to be uh, additional to uh, the proposal um, in terms of additional qualifying matters. Uh, and the Littleton heritage area has also been reduced um, after we've done some further investigation in terms of uh, more street specific analysis. So in the order of about 100 sites or so uh, is lessened by for the Littleton heritage area. Next slide, please. Now, in addition to uh, those qualifying matters uh, that we've just mentioned, we are also looking to update uh, some of the uh, provisions that are associated with uh, various zones. So for the likes of the residential provisions, um, we are looking to also uh, remove the internal garage uh, setback, which is something that the current district plan does. And so just maintaining consistency there. We're seeking to improve the clarity on the 20% uh, glazing requirement that's there. There's quite a lot of um, uh, difficulty in terms of definition of, uh, of, of facade, which we've seen with the benefit of uh, other councils going out with their intensification package. So uh, we're seeking to really um, improve the clarity on, on that provision uh, overall. We are proposing at this stage to introduce a pathway for an increased site coverage for the high density zone uh, under certain criteria and also in the high density zone uh, looking to uh, have minimum height control as well for buildings so um, we don't want to see single level detached dwellings in the high density zone. Um, and also to, I guess, reintroduce uh, the concept of minimum unit sizes um, as well. There's also uh, uh, hoping to be a greater focus on uh, having controls that are more adaptive to fire risk as well, um, especially on the Port Hills, uh, most notably in terms of uh, access for fire appliances to uh, rear parcels. For the central city mixed use zone, um, there is a uh, potential for the 10 storey extent to also be reduced in line with what we had done for uh, the residential uh, proposal in terms of just being the ring around the central city zone. Um, and like I said before, uh, the future urban zone uh, has been 
uh, nuanced in terms of those policy three areas for North Horswell and uh, East Papua Nui, but also we've gone through all the areas that we had previously identified as future urban zone, which is basically the current um, residential new neighbourhood zone. And those areas which have already been developed, we have simply transitioned to um, being the medium density zone as per the rest of our suburban areas, uh, simply because um, the outcomes of the future urban zones have been met. Um, we have also uh, further uh, enhanced, I guess, um, financial contribution controls as well. The thresholds are still uh, are very much the same. Uh, and so uh, there is proposed to be a 20% tree canopy cover for existing sites that needs to be met. Uh, and if that isn't met, then a financial contribution is payable to council. Uh, and there's a 15% tree canopy cover in the road corridors as well that also needs to be achieved in greenfield scenarios for developments uh, also. Uh, and so we're seeking to uh, better capture that in terms of the provisions, um, uh, noting that was previously was proposed to be only in subdivision, and we're looking to capture that through um, the land use controls as well in, in uh, residential provisions. The last one to mention also is uh, specific purpose zones, uh, which cover uh, schools and hospitals. And so they exist within the policy three uh, catchment. And so, like I said previously, that does have a ubiquitous you know, approach to policy three in terms of anything within that catchment needs to be intensified. We had signaled some of that um, in the September proposal, but we hadn't uh, really had the opportunity to give that a thorough um, uh, assessment in terms of the bulk of other controls that need to be evaluated, not just height and isolation. So that's being uh, looked at as part of the update as well. Next slide, please. Uh, one of the more significant components of the alternative uh, is looking at the possibility of uh, restricting the extent of uh, medium density uh, uh, residential areas uh, insofar as their accessibility to core public transport routes uh, and high employment centres. Uh, so the image there that's shown on, on the left uh, is the, the current concept um, for how uh, medium density areas would be restricted. So by land area, that drops the amount of area that would be uh, enabled for um, uh, intensification by about a third. Um, and so we're working through exactly how that detail may look. Um, and it really seeks to capture, like I said, those core public transport routes, um, also enabling uh, the current areas where we have for, for medium density, so not reducing those any further, and also still achieving that high density outcome that is directed by, um, by the MPSUD within and around uh, those commercial centres. Next slide, please. Uh, one of the other most uh, more significant qualifying matters that uh, Council uh, has begun to consider as well is a potential qualifying matter um, related to the unique aspect of, uh, of Christchurch insofar as its latitude and uh, sunlight hours being different. And so um, this would really by, uh, be a qualifying matter that would apply to all residential sites um, uh, across the city uh, and reduce the MDRS directed uh, recession plane, which is uh, set at four metres or, or 60 degrees. Now, this is in the early stages of, uh, of development and we're looking into uh, how we can go about uh, implementing this. But conceptually, under the Act, uh, really any area where there is a qualifying matter that would apply, uh, the MDRS does not have immediate legal effect. So on the face of it, if this were to apply as a qualifying matter across all residential sites, by proxy, this would mean that there would be no immediate legal effect um, upon notification uh, of the plan change. So as I said, we are working through this uh, and hopefully be able to provide um, uh, further uh, detail on this uh, in the new year as well. Next slide, please. Um, lastly, I think it's important to highlight a council's role. We are uh, under uh, a, a, an investigator uh, in terms of being directed uh, by uh, central government. Um, however, it's important to note that council very much must still notify a plan change. And this plan change, despite uh, being 
uh, looked at by an investigator, it is not subject to the approval of the investigator or the minister. Council itself, as in councillors and the mayor, must still approve the plan change. It's only under section 25 of the Act, which has not been enacted, um, that the minister can appoint a person to notify the proposal uh, that the minister supports. And so I think it's really important that people are aware about the situation that we're in, um, the autonomy that council still has in the proposal, uh, and, and really what we can anticipate coming next, which is a good segue into the next slide for Mark to take over. Thank you very much, Ike. Um, so in terms of next steps, uh, we're aware a number of you have been asking what the timing is on Plan Change 14. We um, briefed our council yesterday and are continuing to consider what Ike has described and develop evidence. Um, we're also engaging with the investigator, John Hardy. That will continue into the new year um, of briefing council further on the alternative proposal and developing the evidence to support that. Um, and then moving into February, uh, subject to um, feedback, we will seek approval from council to notify the alternative proposal and continue engaging with the investigator with a view to notification of the plan change in March. Next slide, please. So in terms of um, the process looking ahead, um, the slide provides the different steps in the formal process. So the pink box on the left side indicates notification and where a qualifying matter is not proposed at the time of notification, medium density residential standards would have effect from that date. Submissions would then be invited over what we're predicting would be a period of four to six weeks uh, over March to May. And thereafter, staff will summarise the decisions that have been sought in those submissions and then publish those on our website. There will then be an opportunity for persons to make written submissions supporting or opposing what others have said. The independent hearings panel who have been appointed will convene hearings. The length of those hearings will depend on the number of submissions, but at this point in time, we're anticipating a large response like we did on the draft and assuming a two month period for hearings. The independent hearings panel will then make recommendations to the council and council can either decide to agree with those recommendations or to not. And depending on that decision will affect the subsequent steps. So if the council accepts the recommendations of the independent hearings panel, then those provisions come in, into effect, which we're estimating will be in the early part of 2024. Should the council not agree with the recommendations of the independent hearings panel, then the Minister for the Environment will make a determination and that will then um, that decision will either result in those provisions having effect or not, as the case may be. Um, so ultimately, there's a council decision to be made on the panel's recommendations, but if that decision departs from the IHP's recommendations, then it goes to the minister. And um, thereafter, there's rights of appeal, in some cases being limited. Next slide, please. So I can I now uh, happy to answer questions. We've received a large number, so we'll work through as many as we can. Yeah, if I could just jump in there, Mark. Um, we've had only one come through during the webinar itself. Uh, we have received a high volume ahead of the webinar. Um, but if we could just address first, uh, so we've got a question, uh, MDRS standards to take effect from early 2024. If you'd like to address that. Mark, are you able to respond yeah. to that one? Yeah, sorry about that. Um, so MDR, medium density residential standards, as I mentioned, will take effect from notification unless a qualifying matter applies to an area, in which case 
medium density standards would not apply to that area subject to the qualifying matter until decisions are made in early 2024. Um, so we've just had a question from one of the attendees about how to uh, send in questions. So people have started using the chat function to ask questions. That's perfectly all right. Or you can go to the top of your screen and click on the Q&A tab and type a question in there. Um, and we have had another question come through. Greenfield developments, um, what needs to be allowed for in terms of servicing three waters design? Do we assume maximum theoretical density? Do we have an answer in the room or is that something we'd need to take away? Um, I think that really depends on the local situation. It's not uh, something that um, is static. Uh, it will depend on the network that exists where it's been developed. Uh, I guess the point that I just highlight in terms of the intensification direction is that any of the undeveloped greenfield areas that we currently have, um, we are proposing to be uh, as future urban zone. Uh, and so that would be outside of scope in terms of any medium density um, that applies there or otherwise. And so effectively what we'd be doing, what we are proposing to do as part of this plan change is rehousing what's known as the uh, a residential new neighbourhood zone in the current district plan to a future urban zone and that's simply because of the direction from um, national planning standards. So in practice uh, the requirements of development within greenfield areas um, aren't being changed really through this process. Thanks Mike. Um, just another question for me, is this being recorded for review? It absolutely is. Um, if anyone missed the beginning of this presentation, we are recording the webinar and the recording and just a version of the slides as well and a document with all of the questions and answers. Um, so anything that we can't answer here will be fleshed out. That'll all be sent to you as, an, as a link in the coming days and available on our website. Um, another question for Mark or Ike, qualifying matters could cover all sites regarding recession planes. MDR standards may not apply at notification. Yeah, that's right. So as it's currently um, conceptualised, <laughs> emphasis on conceptualised, uh, under the Act, uh, any area where there is a qualifying matter uh, uh, applying, there wouldn't be immediate legal effect of MDRS. So uh, if council were to progress with a qualifying matter that would restrict um, recession planes for medium density areas, that would mean that by proxy, when council notifies, uh, MDRS standards uh, would not apply uh, uh, upon notification. And uh, on the face of it, the full suite of provisions would come into effect uh, upon the conclusion of the hearing only, um, which would be uh, in the early 2024 at this stage. Just, uh, just following on from Ike's answer there and to answer a question that's been made, um, the operative plan rules would apply until a decision is made in respect of areas subject to a qualifying matter. And in response to another question about designs being prepared to align with the proposed changes, um, what we've described is, of course, subject to council decision, but if uh, council decided to approve the alternative proposal based on what we've presented today, then um, the medium density residential standards would only come into effect, as Ike describes, in early 2024, and um, until such time, the um, any plans would need to be considered against the operative plan. Thanks, Mark. Um, another question, what provision is being made for planning to increase community amenity for denser housing areas, parks, playgrounds, that sort of thing? Is that within these? Yeah, work? so the open space, so that would fall under open space controls for parks, uh, and that really isn't uh, within scope of uh, this plan change. Um, like I said before, we are uh, hamstrung by the direction of the Act in terms of what we can and cannot consider. And so what we, what we can really only consider is those uh, urban residential zones only and the commercial uh, zones within the urban environment uh, and their surrounds as well, and any other associated controls to help deliver that outcome. 
All right, one more from the chat there. Um, in your proposed change, are you saying that all of the Port Hills areas, including the Living Hills areas, um, will have this plan change? Um, we don't have a, a Living Hills zone uh, anymore under the uh, current operative district plan. It's just residential hills. Um, but uh, the short answer is yes, um, because the residential uh, hills zone is an urban residential zone, it is within scope for consideration um, for MDRS. And so if there wouldn't be any qualifying matter that would apply uh, over those hill sites, then MDRS would also be enabled. Um, what we have proposed to date as part of the hills is to introduce a residential hills precinct. Now the precinct effectively would only uh, control vacant allotment size uh, earthworks and access um, in terms of its difference to other medium density areas to ensure that the vacant allotment size is the same as the current um, residential hill zone at 650 square metres uh, and then also to ensure that the earthworks controls are um, suitable for the sloped environment of the Port Hills and also access controls for um, fire access and things like that as well. Thanks, Ike. Uh, we have had a question, how would you describe the role of Mr Hardy in this process and how will he contribute? I think that we would agree we're going to leave that for Mr Hardy to answer in a few minutes. Uh, better to hear it from the horse's mouth. Um, and then a follow-up question, what's the benefit of applying recession planes as a qualifying matter to be sorted out over 2023 rather than just engaging directly with the investigator and trying to get altered recession planes through the March notification set? Yeah, I think as, as before, um, the any proposal that council is putting forward is not subject to the approval of the investigator. Um, we'll let John speak to um, what his role really is uh, in a moment. But in terms of our, I guess, autonomy to notify, we still hold the ability to notify a plan change uh, and that power still very much still sits with, uh, with council. Uh, so yeah, um, hopefully that answers the question. Yeah, we're getting a lot of questions around the um, recession planes now. So if I just jump over to the Q&A, does council see risk in applying recession plane qualifying matter where this limits legal effect of the MDRS? What would seem at odds with the intent of the legislation? There's a, oh, answer this. Um, there's, there's a risk um, of acting in respect of a number of the qualifying matters and through the process, those matters can be tested. Um, part of the evaluation that supports the plan change to be notified will consider the risk of acting or not, and council is aware of that risk, but of course is pending council decision. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Um, does the wastewater constraint precinct count as a qualifying matter? Uh, so, for example, in the area where MDRS rules won't come into effect until 2024 instead of March 23. Yes. Or is, is this area, sorry. Yeah. So there's um, three areas that were defined as subject to a wastewater constraint in the draft and which are still proposed being Shirley, Aranui and Preston's. And within those areas, MDRS would not take effect until decisions after the hearings. So after hearings being 2024. That's right. Yeah. yeah um, uh, this one's about waterways. What protections are in place for waterways affected by intensified housing development? Um, are there any protection from extra pollution from runoff, for example? Can answer this one. Um, so the current district plan has a series of uh, waterway setbacks that are uh, that really uh, prevent any uh, or restrict any development within those setbacks. Uh, they range in size uh, proportionate to the size of the waterway, more or less, uh, and we have captured all of those as a qualifying matter um, as part of this intensification plan change. Uh, and so, uh, any development um, uh, intensification that is uh, can't be progressed uh, within those setbacks. Um, some of them are up to thirty metres from uh, waterway setbacks. Very good. Um... Given Christchurch rates are the most expensive in the country, 
Uh, will CCC also provide costing information to show how their revised proposal will reduce cost to ratepayers versus going with a national approach? I think we might answer that one afterwards. Do you think we might need to do a little bit of um, head scratching over that one? Thank you for the question. We we will respond to that in writing. You've got a second question there, though. Will Christchurch City Council make the costs of challenging the national proposal visible to ratepayers? Um, yeah, again, we'll answer that one after. Yeah, apologies. We will we will definitely answer that. Just probably not the right people in the room right now. Um, what if the design plans are already aligned with the proposed changes? Do we still need to wait until early 2024? So I'm assuming this is if you if you're a developer and you already have design plans on the go. Um, as I was as I was saying earlier, um, any plans? We we'll need to align with the plan in effect at the time. So, if the um, MDRS does not apply to an area until 2000 until 2024, then the plans need to be considered along against the operative district plan. Thanks, Mike. I think this one's very similar. If the area is in a qualifying matter area. Would the operative plan rules still apply until the provision is approved? That's correct, isn't it? That's yeah. right. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, got some new ones coming in. Um, just go back into chat. Excuse me while I toggle between our two systems. With well, going back to recession plans, by making uh, recession plans a qualifying matter. The council is just delaying the inevitable. Other than obvious, what's the benefit? Other than the obvious, what's the benefit of this? I think we're still debating that as staff, aren't we? Is that the um the the, the benefit? Yeah. Um, I'll let I add to this, but the um recession plan serves the recession plan rule in general terms serves to manage the effects of shading and by applying a more restrictive recession plan, it can better manage those effects and provide adequate sunlight to adjoining properties. And that would um, that would be a benefit that we would um, consider alongside the costs of that proposal. Yeah, that's right. And, and I guess it's worthwhile to add that our current district plan um, has a recession plan um, method which is responsive to the orientation of the site relative to to being north uh, and so it has far more of a nuance to it than having a static approach through MDRS uh, and so we're looking to see how we can if at all possible uh, introduce a, a means that is more reflective of our environment um, being the latitude that we're at um, and, and worthwhile to say that uh, you know, all, all of this will have to be tested through um, the independent hearings panel as well, and we'll have to justify that um, through uh, that process. And so it remains to be seen really uh, how the final outcome will be uh, in 2024. Uh, someone has asked if this is a government um, uh, implicated rule or a government led rule, would that override the decision by council or is that completely dependent on council? Is that one for us to answer or? Mr. Hardy, yeah, we can answer well, that. Yeah, I mean, the, the government directed role is, as I've quoted, is effectively what's in the Act in terms of uh, MDRS. Uh, and the Act states that we can reduce that if we can justify a qualifying matter. And so that's the process that we're going through um, to help build that, up that evidence to be able to justify it, uh, just hiding the fact that we do have the ability under the Act to do that, as long as it can be justified as a qualifying matter. Yeah, and I think what's coming out through the questions here is obviously there's a little bit of tension in our community between those who are um, really concerned about what the district plan changes mean for them and those who are really keen to get going and starting to intensify within Christchurch. So lots of good questions. Thank you. Um, and here's an example. We cannot wait until early 2024. A compromise must be made so that things can begin at notification around March 2023. Please discuss. Uh, really not us. Yeah, for it's a 
council decision followed by a hearings process. Um, Mark clearly outlined the process there. We're just the, the first cog in that process, if you like. And then after we put through our draft, um, jump in here, guys, if I'm getting it wrong, but after that, our level of influence is not so great. Yeah, and, and just to highlight through through anything really that we propose uh, under the Act additional to the standards for a qualifying matter, uh, we have to justify the costs and benefits. Um, we haven't yet gone through that process. This is very uh, early in the process in terms of being able to develop this. Um, you know, the intention is that um, we would uh, seek the request to notify in uh, late February uh, next year. Uh, and so we have a time frame to help build up that evidence. Um, and the outcome of that uh, may be different to you know, what we've put forward here today, just highlighting that it is our initial thinking at this stage. Um, and so we'll work through that process and um, hope to update uh, people before we go through the request to notify as well um, in the new year. Mark, did you want to add anything? Uh, the um, in response to uh, questions that are emerging, um, it's the recession. The, the MDRS proposes a recession plan rule, and effectively the qualifying matter would be to propose a different recession plan to what has been uh, directed. Ultimately, it's council's decision of what is notified and that is tested through the process. Thank you. Um, another question. So notification does not equal adoption. It triggers consultation process that the majority of the councillors would need to adopt. I think the answer. Yeah, I think that's quite an important um, aspect just to really emphasise in terms of the next steps, which we did go through earlier on the slides in terms of the process. Uh, it really is that, you know, officers are developing the alternative. The alternative as a package needs to go in front of council in order to accept the uh, notification thereof. Notification simply means that our public submissions and a formal process are open. And so that process is anticipated, anticipated to take between four to six weeks. And so the public can see the full proposal, provide public submissions, um, state in there if they request to be heard. Uh, and then at a later date, the summary of all of uh, those decisions that are requested within those submissions are made publicly available again, uh, and people are uh, again able to uh, submit on uh, uh, each other's, I guess, uh, submission of which ones they um, support or not uh, from there. Uh, and then again, those who have uh, requested to be heard are able to uh, present their case, so to speak, uh, in front of the independent hearings uh, panel uh, as well. So there, there is quite an involved process between now uh, and the hearing, let alone the conclusion of that, which still offers um, quite a lot of opportunity for additional uh, public input. Yeah, thanks, Mike. We've had a, a, another question of the same ilk. Are you planning on uh, additional first schedule consultation before March? So um, I'm assuming that question is similar to the round of consultation that we had um, much earlier in this year. Uh, we haven't got time to do a full scale uh, kind of pre-engagement like that to feed another draft. Um, we've got all of the feedback that we heard in the first round and there was a lot of it. So we think that we've got a pretty good understanding of what the concerns are out there. Um, and there was that opportunity to come and talk to council as well. Um, the process after this, we will definitely be keeping people informed. You can get in touch with us at any time by calling uh, one of the planning team uh, or emailing in your questions. And we're very interested in having a dialogue. We simply don't have time for another round of full-blown consultation. And as Ike just described, the process after we release um, our draft is, is very, very thorough if you are um, very passionate about this, we would encourage everyone to take their opportunity to talk to the hearings panel. Uh, that, that is probably the most um, influential thing that you can do. Um, I don't know if anyone wanted to add anything to that. We will certainly, as more information becomes available, look at um, having more information sessions. Yeah, that's right, Tessa. Um, there's still an expectation that um, Council notifies a plan change to implement the legislation. Christchurch City Council is not exempt from that and we do need to act. So 
um, and act with timing in mind. So um, it's unfortunate, but um, time doesn't allow us to um, consult on a draft again. Recognising that, as Tessa said, a lot of the feedback is and has been considered and we've drawn a number of themes from that feedback to date. Uh, and just a question I'd like to answer before we um, close is when will when will we know if an alternative recession plan will be a QM? We're, as Ike indicated, working through this and we'll be briefing the council again in January and more information will become public thereafter. Uh, the council's decision to notify will be based on a, a report and the draft, the plan change and supporting analysis will be published in the public domain in advance of that meeting. So that will give an understanding of what the council proposal is. Lovely, thanks, Mark. I'm conscious of time. Um, it's 12.59 and we have half an hour left for uh, Mr John Hardy to present to you all. And I know that everyone is very keen to hear what he has to say today. Um, so we'll just close questions there for anyone whose question that we um, have not answered. We have been um, typing all of those down, so we have those recorded. So those that were answered, we'll, we'll respond to those in writing as well, just in case there's some more information that staff want to add on reflection. Um, and then we'll, we'll also answer all of the questions that we didn't get to answer today. Uh, you can keep typing questions throughout the session. We've got another half hour now with um, Mr Hardy, so continue to type. Uh, and as I said, we will make sure that they are all responded to in writing. So I will now hand you over to Mr John Hardy. Everyone, thank you for taking the time to um, to contribute to this. Um, it, it, and I thank you for all of your questions. It's apparent from the questions that uh, there is a misunderstanding of my role. And so what I really want to do in my allotted time mainly is to tell you what my role is and how um, it it is misunderstood by many of you. Uh, in saying that, um, I have had a lot of contact from people who have found my email address and have written to me. I always do people the courtesy of reading what is sent to me, so I have done that. Um, but uh, if I explain my role, and the best way for me to do that, I think, is by taking you through the terms of my appointment. Um, because I didn't determine the role that I was to have. I was asked to undertake a role that had already been predetermined. And so that uh, appointment process and the definition of the role really defines what I can or cannot do. So you should see on your screen um, uh, the, the guts of what it is. So I haven't put the whole document up, but I've I've put up those things um, which I think are relevant. And the first thing is, is that I was to um, let the government know um, what the council's perspective was in relation to housing intensification in Christchurch. And of course, um, the government already knew that there was a very big concern held by the Christchurch City Council as to the statutory requirements that it has because it failed to notify the plan when it had been directed by the government to do exactly that. So none of this is new, but nonetheless, um, my appointment wasn't uh, a direct confrontation between the minister and the council because, as you heard earlier, the minister could have bypassed a role such as mine. The minister could have used powers that he has under the Act when the plan was not notified to simply bring in someone different to me whose role it would have been to actually direct the plan change. 
take the function away from the council, disempower it, and direct uh, as a person required to give effect to legislation what that plan would be. So the minister did not do that. Um, and in the end, it's Minister Twyford, who I answer to, Associate Minister for the Environment. And he's asked me to do an investigation and make sure that I tell the government what the concerns of the council are in relation to um, the government's requirements. And so I propose to do just that. Now, you'll see that from this, I have to take into account the perspective of Naitahu. That's I'm directed to do that. Um, just to as a matter of courtesy to um, the treaty partner, I, that has yet to happen because it's happening next week. So I'm in a role where a directive of uh, my taking into account a particular entities or views, that will happen. It hasn't happened yet. And I have to relay those to the government as well, and I will do that. And then, of course, what you're all concerned about and the reason you're online is because the third part of that investigation was to consider the views of any stakeholders, if relevant. And I certainly understand from the many comments that I have received that many of you are concerned about the outcomes and regard yourselves as relevant stakeholders. Now, I just want to say this, that um, uh, on the question of why I haven't reached out to you, this is how I'm reaching out to you right now. This is my first reaching out to you, but it's not the only way. I, I have read all of the information that's come in. I've spent a lot of time in the material that you presented, not all for uh, some of it for greater intensification, some of it objecting to greater intensification. And I've read all of that. It's a large volume of material, and that's the material that was um, you presented to the council at the time that you were uh, asked to comment on the proposed plan changes. I've even watched a video of what happened on the day when the council did not notify its plan when the um, residence groups in particular had an influence in that outcome. And I've heard what you had to say. Um, you now, some of you, particularly residence groups, want to spend time with me directly one-on-one. -on -one. So I understand your views. I do. I'm sorry. I, I understand your views already. I've read all the material. If you think that I do not understand your views from that material, you're welcome to send me a two-page document to my email address, johnhardymediator at gmail.com, summarising your position. I tell you, I will know it. And that's not just the uh, residence groups who have a particular view. Anyone can do that. I will read it. But of course, at the end of the day, it is for me, not the council and not the government, to decide who I might have to talk to. That's my role. So if I could go uh, on to the next slide, um, please, you'll see that effectively um, the, the true process and what the government wants corrected is the failure of the council to notify a plan change. It was directed, it was mandatory, and it is in breach of its statutory obligations. And the uh, role that I have and the reason I am interacting with council officers is not to tell them what to put in it, their plan. Their, uh, plan. I, it's not my role. My role is to find out if they intend to remedy the current position. And that's why I'm talking to council officers and council members to see if there is an intention to actually go about and complete the statutory obligations. Now, I have assurances to date. The explanations given to me, uh, there are, as you've just heard, 
further changes that are proposed to the original draft, and some of those changes require quite extensive work by way of justification, and that work is being carried out at a fast rate of knots, but I'm satisfied that if, according to this, there is a plan change which is notified in March of next year, that, that will be six months or thereabouts beyond the statutory date. It's not ideal, but that is something that I would uh, say to the minister. Uh, the council is intent on remedying that fundamental defect. That's my primary role. That and everything I do is intended to see if that can come about. If it, and I'm of the view that the council is not prepared to remedy the defect, then if I will be reporting to the government to that effect, and I will recommend alternatives to get the plan notified. Let's, let there be no doubt about that, that the primary obligation is to remedy the current breach, and that is my role. Now, in doing that, I want to tell you the two things that I can. The first is I am not in the business of telling the Christchurch City Council what to put in that plan to be notified. It's not part of the role. Uh, it's for the council officers and the council to decide the form that is notified. And I don't come in and say, but you've got to do this, you've got to do that. Why haven't you done that? That is not my role. I am talking to officers about how they're going about the process of remedying the defect. And there are some questions about that. There is some concern that I am in some way or might influence the actual content of that document. And the answer is, I have no intention of influencing it. I have no authority to influence it. That's the first thing. Also, there's quite clear from questions and from views that people think somehow I have some right or obligation to direct the government to change its legislation that's currently in place. I have no power to direct the government to change legislation. And what's more, I am not asked to tell the government what would be better by way of uh, legislation that's currently in place. What I can do is tell the government what the council feels about the situation. That's what I'm directed to do. And for those of you who are concerned, and it certainly is a residence group's concern, that if I say to the government what the council's concerns are, that won't in itself tell the government what the concerns of the residence groups are. So I think my answer to that is what I will do is I will regard myself as through my power to tell the council what the council's views are. I will incorporate the views of other interested parties in that document. So you will be heard in an indirect way through the report I deliver to the government. And the last thing I want to say is, is that no one is directing me in how I go about this role. The government or the ministry are not directing me because they have no power to do that. The council is not directing me. I'm an independent person. I get to decide, rightly or wrongly, how this role is carried out. And the fault lies with me if you think that I have not done a good job. But it is me who has to make that decision. So uh, this is the timing. Um, I will be uh, giving an indication to the government as to how things are progressing. And I'll probably write a short report about that um, before Christmas. Um, and I'll let you know, I'll tell them that I'm, I'm working collaboratively with council, 
councillors and council staff, and I have every confidence that in the uh, there will be a plan notified. And um, the second uh, thing is, is that of course there has to be a D day. There has to be a point when I present a final report, and the date for that is in March of next year. And uh, that date will coincide with. Uh, decisions on the, by the council as to whether or not to actually notify the plan. Um, I have to know whether that at, that event takes place, because if it doesn't take place, then my report will be written in different terms to if it is. And we know now that there's a date by which the uh, plan is to be notified. The council will make its decision in early March. So the time frame of all of this is not to be resolved this year. It must go through until March, and there is a little thing called the Christmas holidays there, and some people uh, will want to go and have some leave, and they should be entitled to that, and so will I want to have some leave. So I've looked at the timeline that's proposed, and I'm satisfied that given the obligations the Council has, that that is a very tight uh, timeline. Um, now, I think that's what I wanted to explain to you about my role. And now there have been a, a, a great number of questions which have been presented to me in advance. And I want to say that most of them I cannot answer because they relate to matters which are properly within the purview of the council itself. And so uh, I can't answer them. I do not know the detail of the Plan. I, I listened in to the seminar that was presented from 12 to 1, and I'm now better informed about some things. And because it wasn't my role to go and find out exactly what was proposed, it's just a, I'm, I'm there with an overview. So that was helpful to me, and I hope what was said was helpful to you. I've got a better idea. There are some changes coming. Um, at the end of the day, uh, I will talk about process a little bit more before I answer your questions. Um, some of them are why haven't I had interviews with you? Well, I hope um, I'm not proposing to have one on one interviews with every person who considers themselves a stakeholder. Frankly, every citizen of Christchurch considers themselves a stakeholder. And some of you represent citizens in some shape or form. You're collective groups, such as residence groups, or your collective groups uh, representing developers and the like. All of those are, are relevant people who have a view, at, and I understand the view. Anyone's welcome to give me a two-pager and I'll do you the courtesy of reading it, but if you give me 20 or 50 pages, I won't, because the fact of the matter is, is that if every single person did that, I would be spending a lot of my time doing something which is not relevant to me, given the obligations I've got in my letter of appointment. Uh, so my final comment about process is this. The process, as you've heard, is one which requires a council to promote a plan. Uh, then there is public participation. And the public participation is through a submission process and a hearings panel. And in my life as a practicing lawyer, I did a lot of work in the RN field. I did a lot of presentation uh, before various panels on various plans in various parts of the country. And I just say to you all, if you, if what is notified does not meet your concerns, um, say something about it, participate. That's the right. Um, and you get to have your say. And personally, I have to say that I've represented uh, residence groups in that process before. So it doesn't matter whether you are a developer who's interested in increased density or a resident who doesn't want any increased density. Those views are entitled to be heard. I always say to people, 
It's not the lawyers who are important in their process. It's the experts who might help you and support your case. And so think about present, presenting cases that actually put your point of view. And, it, and if there's two things that I would like to draw your attention to, which are quite important given the way the legislation has been framed, and they've been talked about um, by Mark and other council staff, there's two issues. And one is, what is a qualifying matter? And the council has got a very strict a test, if it has a qualifying matter, it has to produce, uh, from a statutory point of view, uh, quite a lot of evidence to support the assertion that it's a qualifying matter. But any citizen of Christchurch submitting can submit that there is a qualifying matter that's been missed out. So have a look at what they are and think whether or not those matters are properly qualifying matters. And if you're on the other side of the fence and you find that there's a qualifying matter which has been included and you don't agree with it, then you have a chance to make a submission on that and you might influence outcomes. And the other uh, critical thing, I think, is what is known as a, a walkable catchment. And a walkable catchment is, of course, relevant to these very high density zones which uh, are going to be included in some shape or form in the plan. And those walkable catchments, um, they, you can submit on what is a walkable catchment. You can produce some information and evidence which might change the boundaries of walkable catchments. So it's not my role to be a lawyer and tell you what to do, but I at least point to two obvious areas where you could uh, submit to a hearings panel and the outcome of those submissions might change the plan as notified. Once it's notified, it's not over. There's a hearings process. Now, having said that, um, let me see if I can answer some questions. Um, and uh, I wonder if I might get some help, because although I'm independent, when it comes to this, there's been a whole series of questions that have been proposed in advance, many of them I didn't think I was capable of answering because they're more properly answered by the council. But there will have been questions that will have come in while I've been talking, and I'm going to ask someone if they, they can explain, explain to me uh, what, what those questions are and where I might find them on my screen and see if I can um, answer them, if, if there are any. Thanks, John. Yep, we're just going to come around and help you with that now. So we have had a couple of questions come up in the chat and we have responded to a few of those. So I suppose now's your cue for all of the people listening in. If you do have some questions that are definitely for Mr John Hardy, now's your chance to type them and he will start to respond to some of them now. Oh, okay. by the way, I see Tony is also, um, whom I personally know. We live in the same street and is the chair of the Rickon and Bush Kulman Expressions Association. I know that association well. I, many years ago, I was responsible for the drafting of that incorporated society, and I was a member for many years. I'm not now. Um, Tony, you, you've got my note. You, you, you wanted to meet with me. Uh, on behalf of other residents groups as well, you know that I've, I've answered that, that I don't at the moment see a need for it, but you're welcome as a collective groups to write to me um, if you think I don't understand your views. I'm telling you I think I do, but you think otherwise, but don't give me a 15-page missive. Summarise it now. John, did you see there that there's a question um if it is notified, the plan change, uh, but the plan is unsatisfactory to you, what then, what action would you take? Yes. It, can I tell the, the writer of that question, um, I have no role once it's notified. It's as simple as that. Uh, my work is done. Uh, my work is done because I'm not there to be involved in what plan contains 
and I'm not there to tell the government that its legislation is unacceptable to the people of Christchurch. Look if I go up here and let's see. We did answer on your behalf, John, um, in terms of the timing of your investigation and report. We did put that we anticipated that to be mid March 2023. Are you right to confirm that? Yes, for that's right. There is actually a time limit which I need to discuss with the government. Um, they are hoping that I might have a final report right at the very commencement of March, and I will discuss with them putting that off for a couple of weeks. So I just say to all of you, the date I'm anticipating uh, finalising my work is um, early to mid-March of next year. Yes, so any a lot of these questions for me are to do with particular aspects of the plan and because I don't even know what's in the plan like I couldn't answer them even if I wanted. Uh, actually, it's, it's, I will say this. Um, I have an independent person appointed by the government and I believe my appointment was approved by the council itself and I was one for a number of names put forward for the role. I'm the only person who was put forward for this role who actually lived in Christchurch. So uh, the appointment, uh, the government's acceptance of me as a suitable person and the council's acceptance of me as a, as a person is premised upon the fact that I am a person who lives here and will be affected by these changes. I'm quite capable of being uh, independent in my work, but that's not to say when this plan is notified that I might not be submitting on the plan to in, in relation to my own interests. Um, I don't know yet, but uh, I certainly have in the past taken a position as a citizen and ratepayer about things that are in plans, um, and I may do that again, but that will be quite a different role. I will have, at the time that that happened, this role will have finished and I'll return to my rights as an individual citizen or ratepayer. John, apologies, there's a bit of an echo, so I'm just going to talk across the room at you. Uh, there is a question there. How could CCC plan to notify in March if the investigation won't be finished until late March? Are you able to talk to the alignment of those two timeframes? Yes. Um, so the position is this, that the primary purpose of my role is to uh, be satisfied that the council will notify. That I will not know that for sure until a resolution is passed by the councillors to notify the plan. And that is set down for a date in early March. And so if they do notify, I will be able to say to the government, the plan is notified, my work is at an end. If the council decides not to notify, then um, I'm letting everyone know that will be a different report that I write because uh, the council will not have done anything to remedy its breach of statutory duty. And there are people out there who are affected by that right now. I'm well aware of that. Um, and people who had plans. So the fact of the matter is, is that uh, it won't take me long after I know the council is not doing its job for me to advise the government what I think would be appropriate steps for it to take. I won't take them. I will just give advice to the government. And again, it's just advice. Um, mm. I'm not there to tell it what to do. Uh, the role simply is one of giving advice to the government. Um, I'm told that uh, my time is going to come to an end shortly. Um, I'm doing this again this evening for, um, for uh, those who couldn't attend this uh, lunchtime seminar. If uh, between uh, now and this evening, I think the, my time is from 7 to 7.30 p.m. tonight, if uh, those of you who are online haven't had a question answered, uh, you're welcome to leave a note of your question for tonight, and I'll have a chance to review those before I come online in the evening. 
uh, you don't have to even be online tonight because I've heard that there will be a record of this which is available to all of you um, through the council's website or in some other way that they will determine. So uh, you will uh, hear if I have got something to say about a question you've asked. But thank you for participating and uh, being with me. And I hope what I've said is helpful to you. It's what I say is not going to please everyone, but it's important that you did understand the role that I've been given. Thanks, John. And I think Thanks that those way. words really summarise the um, awkward situation that we often find ourselves in. Uh, we're definitely not going to satisfy everybody throughout this process. There are going to be those who uh, feel that they have gained and those who feel that they have lost. And, and that's just a process that we need to go through. Um, thank you very much uh, to everyone for taking time out of your day to join us. If you have any feedback about the session or further questions, you can contact our engagement team. Um, details on the slide in front of you now. As we've said several times, we will be in touch over the coming days with answers to any outstanding questions, a copy of the presentation and links to watch the recording of this and this evening's session. So as John said, he might answer some of the questions posed today this evening and you'll have the opportunity to either look through that question spreadsheet or uh, if you want to hear uh, it verbally, then you can, you'll be able to watch the session. Um, Thanks again from myself and all of the staff and Mr. John Hardy, uh, John Hardy, sorry, Harera, and goodbye.